Hello again, and this is the podcast Paranormal Family Therapy, and I am the host, Dr. Darren Wallace. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, a licensed clinical social worker, and a certified addictions counselor. And I've been working with families since around 1996. And I've been working with families dealing with paranormal phenomena in family therapy since 2002, so about 20 years. Now, Paranormal Family Therapy is a podcast that talks about paranormal phenomena and how the psychotherapeutic community interacts with the paranormal with family therapy in particular. Now, today we're fortunate to have Ryan Buell here with us. Uh, Now, Ryan is definitely uh, familiar to some of you in the paranormal community as he has been the host and the executive producer of A&E's Paranormal State which aired in the late 2000s and early 2010s. And he is the founder of the Paranormal Research Society or PRS. He's an author, including the book, Paranormal State, My Journey into the Unknown. And he is currently a graduate student, which I'm really interested in. Uh, He's a current graduate student at the University of South Carolina, where he's getting his master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. So welcome to Paranormal Family Therapy, Ryan. It's great to have you here today. I know you're really busy writing papers and reading and doing all kinds of busy stuff with uh, your graduate program. So thanks for taking the time with us today. Yeah, no problem. I feel like every counselor who's listening in is like, oof, you know, I'm just starting my second year psychopathology. It's it's crazy. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. (laughs) Ugh. Yeah, it's. A, I, I'm sure you've got all kinds of reading, all kinds of writing, uh, all kinds of things that you have to think about. And, and then uh, um, here pretty soon, you're going to do all the uh, actual clinical work with uh, students. So I'm excited about how that's going to, you know, be for you. Um, so, Ryan, um, before we get started, uh, can you, with some of these detailed questions, uh, help us to understand um, how you got your start working with the paranormal uh, and doing paranormal investigations. Where did that uh, get started for you? Well, I think it's important to remember that when I was growing up, times were different in terms of how people perceived here in America, you know, the conversation of the paranormal. Mm -hmm. So like in the eighties, in early 90s there weren't there was an entire channel devoted to the paranormal there weren't podcasts there weren't there was nothing mm-hmm. um it was definitely taboo and so like when i was growing up i had some really weird experiences grow, you know when i moved to south carolina there was a lot of stress in my family my uh you know my parents divorced then you know with my stepdad he was in the military and the Gulf War happened. And so it was just myself, mom, and then my my younger brother, who was an infant. And then just like we moved into this house and just like this weird, bizarre stuff started happening. And like it was terrible, it was scary. You know, like mm-hmm. it's funny because growing up, I'm like, oh, okay, the closet door opens up. Okay, a, a glass of milk flew across the kitchen table. Oh, that's nice. But when you're home alone and you're seven or eight, you're like, what is that? It's yeah. it's for anybody, it's scary. And so it started off like things like that. And then it just kept escalating. And of course, in my mind, I, I revisit sometimes when I'm laying in bed and I'm just thinking about the past or whatever. I'll think about past experiences and I'll go, was it really that? But then there are just there's these incidents that I still can't explain. And, you know, like, then I started hearing voices and, and then they started interacting with me and it was feeding off of my fear. Uh And I remember the gist I want to share is that how scared I was. Yeah. Like it was, it was like being kind of assaulted in your own home or terrorized, but you couldn't talk about it with anybody. And, you know, like you're seeing these things and you're trying to tell your parents and they're like, oh, that stuff's not real. Okay. He's seven. Mm -hmm. He's eight. It's overactive imagination. You know, he's got some trouble adjusting, but you're seeing these things and they're, they're real to you. 
So you learn to start pushing it inward. Mm -hmm. Um, But there were just times where like, I was just so frightened. Like I know my mom hates when I tell this story, but like one instant where I just kept seeing this apparition and it was not necessarily human in form. Like it had like, it almost looked like a goblin type thing. And it just kept appearing outside my bedroom and I kept screaming. Yeah. My mom was tired, overworked, stressed about what was going on overseas with my stepdad. And then like, as I'm laying there, then it doesn't show up in front of the door. It shows up by my bed and just rises up Mm. and had this grin. And I mean, it's a terror. It scared the, the, the Jesus out of me, but I quickly learned that I couldn't, nobody knew what to do. I couldn't talk about it. I couldn't articulate why back then or process why I just knew that I was on my own with this, whatever was going on, it was something I had to internalize. And then, you know, it just kind of went away after a couple of years. Um, and I just remember, like, I I feel like I kind of repressed it, Mm -hmm. but then it, it, sometime in my mid teens, it started to just push out. Like, like I couldn't, it was just coming out of me. Like, you know, this thing, this thing that happened to you. And, you know, the internet became a thing. I don't know how it happened, but I started to, you know, browse. I somehow I came across websites that talked about ghost hunters mm-hmm. and paranormal investigators. And I knew about Ed and Lorraine Warren because they'd been on TV before. And I think there was a book in my library, my school library, you know, that had some one of their books was there and I just was like, there, this is a thing. Mm-hmm. Like people out there have had these experiences. Not only that, there are people who investigate this. And so it was just like a part of me awakened. And I was just like, I have to know more about this. And so like, I started writing to people, of course, no one wanted to take a 15 year old kid on investigation, you know, but, um, <laughs> So I started my own, like I, I was like the editor of my high school newspaper in Sumter, South Carolina. So like, I kind of used that as an, as like an in. Mm-hmm. So like, oh, we're having a Halloween edition paper, you know? So let's talk about ghost stories. Oh, let me investigate your, this property. And, and you know, people let us in because, oh, okay, it's for the newspaper, it's Halloween season, whatever. But there was a, a there was a personal reason that I was doing it. And I think for a lot of people who've investigated, especially er in those earlier days, uh, I I think when you ask yourself, like, why does a grown man or a grown woman devote their lives to chasing invisible things in the dark? There was probably something that happened to them that was somewhat traumatic. And Mm -hmm. maybe this is their way of trying to to work through it. Um, So then I went to Penn State. And again, I was like, well, I'm in Pittsburgh now. I went to a branch campus. I'm like, well, maybe there'll be something there. And there was nothing. So I started a group and I went to the main campus and they were like 600 student clubs. I'm like, oh, there's got to be one. There wasn't. Yeah. So people were like, well, you should start one. I didn't want to start anything. I wanted to join something. I, I had this image in my head of finding some like, I don't know, professor like in a tweed jacket or something like that, you know, who was a parapsychologist mm-hmm. and no. So it was, it was me. Um, and then what I found was that more and more people were like, yes, I've had experiences too. And people were like, I'm having experiences now. Can you help me? And that wasn't really my goal. My goal was to try to find answers for myself, but that kind of got put to the side because suddenly Every year we were tripling the amount of case intakes, you know, people reaching out to us. And then, you know, we had a bunch of TV networks hit us up. You know, we started working with some people in the university, look, you know, the psychologists and whatnot and therapists. And even though we were a student organization, we kind of operated like a department. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, we kind of got a lot of national interest there. And then A&E said, we want to do a show that just documents what you do. I said, mm-hmm. okay. 
next thing you know, that's, it was, that's what happened. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. For, <laughs> if I can ask, uh, cause I'm interested in this, uh, Ryan, um, when you were seven or eight and all of these things were happening to you, um, now I know some of what you needed to have happen didn't, but if you could, what would, what would have been helpful for you back then? Like if, uh, you were to talk to, you know, someone like me and someone, you know, like you, uh, what you're going to be, uh, which is, uh, working in the psychotherapeutic realm, how could have someone helped you with what you were experiencing as a, you know, seven or eight year old, which is, you know, third, fourth grade. Being willing to believe me. Yeah. Or being ready to believe me. Like I had a child psychologist. Mm -hmm. Um, I even consult, you know, my mom took me to a priest, (laughs) just Mm -hmm. like, yeah, you know, but I remember my child, she was really awesome. She was helpful in so many ways, but when it came to the paranormal stuff, you, it was obvious even to a seven, eight year old, like, I don't want to hear about that shit, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, like I understand that a lot of people, you know, kids, yes, they can have an overactive imagination, but you never know. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that was the core element of just like, what will tell me a little bit more about what's happening, you know, and, and hearing me and listening to me. And then I think helping me work through that fear, Mm -hmm. but really the the biggest problem was just feeling alone. Like I felt like I was the only person in the universe who was having these problems And so I felt very isolated. And so I acted as such. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that, I think that element that you're talking about is uh, fairly common with uh, kids in their families or they're isolated from one, like maybe one of their parents, maybe not both. Uh, But this is a familiar tale to me, um, which is me being that person that listens, you know, to the child or children, if there's a couple of them, um, or an adult, um, where others around are not. And that's part of the family therapy, at least that I do, which is to try to yes, listen to them, but then also help their family members, uh, which they, that's who's going to be, uh, involved with them long after I'm gone, uh, to help them to listen to the person. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times where, um, you know, I've worked with a, a family where it's getting either the family or one family member to really listen and be attentive to that, you know, the person that this might be, you know, centered around, or if there's a few people that are, you know, seeing these things or feeling them, uh, to be able to be open to that. And that's often the therapy, right? And it's not just because of a ghost or a haunting, but that actually permeates in other areas of their life. You know, it just so happens that in this instance, it's a, around a haunting in the house, not, uh, and it's not isolated. Usually they're having that same issue, you know, with other things in their lives. And so I think it's very important to be able to help connect family members, you know, with the, you know, person that's experiencing something like you did. Sure. I mean, and think about it. Think about a kid who wakes up and they feel like they're pinned down and they're being choked. Yes. By so, and now that by that alone, you're like, oh my God, who did that? Then you say, I opened my eyes and there was literally nothing there. Mm -hmm. And the experience, whether it's sleep paralysis, something else, the experience is real to them. And that's frightening. It's frightening to have anyone assault you, but when you don't, see anything yeah that's even more frightening and then you tell your parents who are supposed to be your guardians your your protectors and they just go oh my god whatever Mm -hmm. it's it's kind of like um you know i kind of attribute it to like and i hope this doesn't come off insensitive but like almost like a rape yeah something or an assault like and no one believing the person um so not all cases are as dramatic as that but like it, it's just, it can be frightening. And then if you don't deal with that, I think it just kind of, I don't know, something happens as they continue to develop 
you know, especially with kids, when they have this traumatic experience, but this traumatic experience is considered too taboo to work through. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm hearing you and, and what it, it can also be is yes, folks are not believe the, you know, some kind of traumatic event, whether it's, you know, what you're describing, or they're seeing an aberration, or they're seeing a mist, or they're seeing something that's frightening them. They go to their parents, the parents don't believe what they're saying. They might even punish the child um, for what's happening to them. Uh, and then the tremendous amount of uh, destruction that that, do that does to the trust that they have with one another, uh, and then what that does to the kids. So at least in family therapy, how to uh, work through some of that, work on that and reestablish that trusting relationship, obviously is pretty huge. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, and that could be, that could, again, I, I see, like, I don't blame my mom for her not being receptive because it's kind of the norm, you know, sure. like I get yeah. it. That's, I think, where the role of a therapist can come in. They can kind of be that outside force that says, okay, um, let me hear you out. Let me mm -hmm. take this seriously. Yeah, and, and be able to, uh, you know, work with not only the the child or the children or whoever it is, uh, but also help connect them with uh, the people around them that will be there long after the therapy is over, right? And yeah. Still, yeah. So that's good to hear that. Yeah, that's what could have been, uh, you know, better for you, and you know, had that have been something that you would have done, you know, back when you were eight or nine years old. Now, when you work with, uh, you, you go into, uh, you know, haunted houses now um, or places. Um, do you, you know, when the cameras are going, there's probably, that's probably one thing, but if you're just doing investigations, you know, on your own without, uh, you know, for a TV show or something, how do you work with the family? Like, what do you do with them? Um, you know, if they're inviting you into the house to do an investigation, how do you work with them? <clears throat> well, this is how I've done it prior to going into grad school for therapy. Cause I, a lot of my work in the paranormal has influenced, you know, my decision to go into, you know, school to become a therapist. Uh -huh. But it's almost like uh, I, I saw our role as almost like we're the EMTs. Uh -huh. You know, we're, we're there to be on site for the emergency um, to handle like, you know, bandaging them up, kind of getting them, you know, protecting them from anything worse. We, so we do the interview, the intake, and a lot of times we find when we're talking to these clients that, you know, there's a lot more going on than just, oh, my God, I'm hearing noises. Oh, my God, you know, we're being attacked. Mm -hmm. That there's a lot of discord in the family that, that yeah. there's it's almost like, you know, they as a family are disrupted. And it was like building up before the paranormal activity or even going along with it. So that's why we started really working with like psychologists and counselors, because a lot of what we were trying to help them work through was that fear mm -hmm. and also some of the other things going on in their lives. And once they started to like repair some of that and almost always there was a disconnect between the people living in the house, like there were strained relationships, they yeah. were irritable towards each other or they weren't depending on one another as a family unit. So we would kind of try to help repair that. And of course, we would do our investigation, like, you know, with the gadgets. And by gadgets, I don't mean those weird blinky light things. I'm talking like surveillance systems, audio recordings, thermal cameras, um, you know, practical stuff. But then we would do other things like we would do, um, you know, we. I guess, get collateral information elsewhere, like talking to witnesses, doing historical research, looking at their records, if they were seeing therapists before doctors, and we would just find certain connections. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like some, so a lot of these people would move into a house and they would have this haunting happen. But then we would talk to the previous owners and sometimes the previous owners like, no, I lived there and it was, everything was fine. Then like three owners back, we'd find someone, one of them had an experience. 
And we, when we asked them like what was going on, we found connections there that like some of them may have had marital issues, mm -hmm. uh, you know, trauma or sexual abuse history, very similar to the current client. And it's almost like maybe that's why the phenomenon was happening to them, that whatever's there, it's like energy, you know, like yes. it attracted was attracted to what is it that Lorraine used to say? Um, they talked about the law of attraction mm -hmm. and how, you know, in the spirit realm, they can be attracted to your energy or personality, which kind of makes sense because, you know, in a crowded room or at a party, we subconsciously may gravitate to certain people that we kind of relate to, you know, or if you think about high school mm -hmm. and the cliques and how everyone just signed it kind of figures it out in forums, you know, relationships. Um, there's a, there's a barrier there, you know, but somehow maybe in the spirit world, they can still find personalities that they kind of, I don't want to say identify with, but they just kind of link up with. Mm -hmm. Well, I like that idea because it makes sense, um, with some of the work that I've done where, you know, things are chaotic, uh, they might actually show up in the house. Now, I rarely actually go into a house and do um, in-home therapy, um, but I'll have, you know, clients describe it. If it's chaotic with them, you know, how clean is your house? And this isn't some like clever way for me to help them clean the house and get kids to, you know, clean up their room, but to physically clean the house, right? To physically organize their house to uh, emotionally uh, be able to change, you know, how chaotic it is and so that there's more structure, right? There's more predictability. So all of the, you know, things that create all of these emotional, um, all of the things that create emotional turmoil uh, are being worked at and literally in their house, they're being organized as well uh, to clean the house. I mean, sometimes they they have a filthy house and it makes sense yeah. that something is going to uh, take advantage of all of these emotions, you know, that are going on. And so it's good to be able to yeah, have that experience where, and, it, you know, sometimes kids are like, did you, did you talk to my parents about cleaning my room? Because they're always wanting me to clean the room. And the rest of the house is messy. And why should I? Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> I was just laughing when you were saying that because it reminded me of a client I had in Syracuse, New York. And they were experiencing what we would call demonic phenomenon. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes people look at us like exterminators, like, oh, just come in there and fix it. I'm like, that is not what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, and this was documented in our show, like they could have they could have been on Hoarders, another A&E mm -hmm. show. And I think that was an A&E show. Yeah. And like, I mean, just you go into their vehicle and like trash was up to where you would sit all throughout the vehicle in their house trash everywhere and so when we sat down we gave them homework we're like we will do these things but here's what you need to do yeah. you need to clean your house you and then the the couple the husband and wife they were having some severe marital strife and it was like you know we you need to start going to some counseling for that and I remember back then people were like, what? Mm -hmm. That's what you recommend? It's like, yes. It, logically, it makes absolute sense. Yeah. But again, you know, because we're dealing with something, some unknown element like ghosts, they think, oh, you know, get a, give me a talisman and it'll go away. Mm -hmm. No, that's not how it works. You know, the, it's just like how I'm sure people come to you and they're like, I'm sure you've heard this all the time. I just want you to tell me how to fix me. Mm-hmm. And you're like, that's not what we do. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, well, 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 we do somewhat try to help them fix themselves, but it's not necessarily the path that they might imagine, right? It's actually yeah, but, working on their relationship and their connection with one another and relieving uh, all of the tension that's going on, you know, between family members, or at least alleviating some of it. Uh, so wait, that they, they have they're connected. Yeah. They have work they have to do. Yeah. You know, and it, it's not, you're going to tell them in a way of a magic wand and, well, you have this and you have this. And yeah. It's, voila. 
you know, Voila, so. some spiritual person with authority comes in and, uh, you know, kicks them all out and th then it's good to go. It's like, no, no, you got to make sure that, uh, um, you don't attract these things back. Even if you do have a, a spiritual person that might do something like that, uh, you have to make it so that uh, the environment uh, and the systems around them are strong and uh, are able to repel, you know, anything coming back. Yeah. And like, I have my theories that may seem a little weird, but like, you know, it's like thinking about like an exterminator, you know, or getting rid of, a roach infestation okay like you have someone come and spray but if you're gonna leave food out and trash everywhere they're gonna come right back in yeah uh -huh. um and you're right you know if you are not spiritually healthy if you are not emotionally healthy and i'm not saying perfect but like if you aren't working on yourself and the people around you in your environment like it's gonna keep coming back i mean there are some rare exceptions to that some really extreme cases, but for the most part, like even Ed and Lorraine, you know, they would be like, yeah, we can have an exorcism, you know, and it, this meets all the criteria for formal exorcism, but there's all this other stuff that has to happen too. Mm -hmm. So I'm just hoping therapists, when they listen to this, they, so I did, I, and you know this, cause I was consulting with you like all the time. I did a research paper on anomalous experience therapy yes and there's very little research about it but some people are making headway overseas and they did like a, a qualitative study about you know therapist perceptions on the paranormal one of the biggest things is that therapists it's not necessarily that all of them don't believe in the paranormal it's just that they don't feel as if they're equipped to deal with it or handle it mm -hmm. so they kind of shut down and you know, especially as I'm going through the program, I'm like, no, like therapists can absolutely have all the tools they need to help people with this. If that makes any sense. Well, that makes sense. I, I, you know, since you and I have been talking, I mean, I've been thinking about this actually for a long time, how to, uh, you know, create uh, not necessarily like a cookie cutter uh, version of how to, you know, handle the paranormal in, you know, family therapy, but some uh, like a guidebook um to what people yeah. can keep in mind in order to work best with you know this particular population because the thing is is with therapists and what what that book would talk about is just use a lot of the things that you do anyway um it just so happens that the content of what is being talked about is there's a you know some kind of spiritual issue going on Right. But the the process that people go through and, you know, and therapists know that idea, you know, process versus content, the process that they're going through with the therapist, with each other, if it's a family or a couple is still going to be very similar in order to be able to deal with this. And, and so being able to, you know, part, part of this podcast is help, uh, you know, therapists to see yeah, that you're not alone and that there's other, you know, and there's places to uh, reference and people to talk to. And there's other people that are interested in this that are therapists them themselves about, um, you know, how to work with paranormal phenomena. <clears throat> yeah, I, I've been, I, I slowly started introducing that part of me into my department. I was like, they're uh -huh. going to kick me out. <laughs> but they were like, uh -huh. they, yeah, but they, they looked at it and they're like, that's interesting, you know, like, it's something we hadn't considered, you know, not that I've created any new ideas at, not at all. It's just, and I actually found that like a lot of, like they understand the concept behind it, which is just helping people mm -hmm. and the multicultural aspect of it, which is that these are the, you could look at it as these are their beliefs. Um, but no, there, it's cool to know that there are actually other therapists and counselors out there who I think a lot of, counselors have had at least one client mention the paranormal mm -hmm. so or at least and and uh um i know at least from my experience when i share with uh folks because most of my caseload is not haunted houses right it's people that are you know someone cheated on somebody else or they've got a drinking problem or somebody lost their their job and there's all kinds of turmoil happening in the family 
is that when I share with them, oh yeah, because they'll read in my, you know, my website or on my little business cards that I, I give them for their next appointment. Um, they're like, what's this paranormal thing that you do? You know, then I tell them and they're like, really, there's, you, you do that? And they're like, yeah, yeah. So it, it's small part of my practice, but, but yeah. And, uh, uh, they, and then they'll just tell you, well, you know what? When I was a kid and I was at my grandma's house, blah, 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 blah. Or, you know, you know, we were at this, you know, place and it was a, we were camping in a cabin and uh, this weird ass black mist showed up in the middle of the freaking cabin. You know, they always have, you know, folks, most people have an experience. Um, I don't know some of the research that you've done is that most people actually have had a paranormal experience in their life that they can't really explain. Uh, and then some people have it frequently, uh, depending on what's going on for them. And so, yeah, it is fairly common. I think people are coming out of the closet too, so to speak, about their experiences. Like I remember 20 years ago, you would mention it and they would all look at you like, Ugh. but the moment they were alone with you, they might go, well, yeah, I had this one thing, but they wanted to make sure everyone knew that they didn't believe in that stuff. And now it's just like, yeah, totally. Oh my God. You know, uh -huh. and that's, I'm happy about that in the sense that it's people, it's more accepting to talk about it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, when, uh, um, when you do go work with these families, uh, it sounds like, you know, there's usually some kind of turmoil that's happening with them. Any other patterns or things that you notice, uh, any themes at all around, uh, you know, these families that you're working with? <laughs> The, I'm trying to think of the right terms. Like isolation is is a key is a big one. Uh -huh. Like like if there is a family, and I'm I'm using some of your terminology since I've gotten to know you, uh -huh. <laughs> family unit and stuff like that. But like if there's a family together, usually the person who is the target of the attacks or the phenomena the most is the one who's also become a bit isolated. So like here's the family, and then they're they're over here. Yeah. Um, and like, I'm thinking about one of our more famous cases, I am six is what it was called. And, you know, uh, Laura had a lot of medical conditions. She had a bright future ahead of her, but then she had all these medical conditions that kind of made her homebound. And, you know, so she started reaching out to, you know, she'd always heard her house was haunted. So she started, you know, she had a lot of time on her hands and she couldn't go outside half the time. So she just started playing with Ouija boards and then she developed a connection to something and did EVP recordings, which is where you ask questions on a recorder and then you see if something responds via playback. You know, she thought she was developing this relationship. Um, there was another case where a woman was literally doing EVP sessions 24 hours a day in her house. And then when she would wake up, she would just review all the, it's all she would do. Mm -hmm. Like her friends would come by and they'd be like, Oh, Carol Ann's upstairs. And she would just say hi. And she stopped interacting with them. So some people have found themselves going, you know, through their isolation, they're, they're going through some depression, loneliness. They start, almost finding the spirit world as like a relationship. Mm -hmm. But even in the ones where that isn't the case, where they didn't seek it out, there's still, especially in demonic cases, there's a lot of isolation and loneliness. Um, trauma is a big one. Yes. Um, like there, there's been some trauma in the past that hasn't been worked through. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we see a lot of, I mean, I see different patterns for different things, but one of the core ones that we do, because we normally take on the more severe cases, we see that one a lot. Yeah, that um, makes sense. I, uh, there was a period in my career where uh, I worked almost exclusively with people with uh, uh, schizophrenia. Um, and part of the work that I did, which, you know, for the agency that I worked for, they had not really had someone like me work for them um, is how to connect them with others, right? They live in these group homes, but they kind of, you know, 
frequently people just, you know, had contact with them, family members when they had to. And instead, what we were working, what I was working with them on was how to connect them with family members, how to uh, connect the person with um, uh, the staff at the group home that they lived in, you know, things like that. And what I learned from that is how, and it was a, this great experience because it was helpful later on in the paranormal work that I did, was how to connect people that are isolated, right? Someone is seeing and hearing something that others are not, or one person is not, like a parent, uh, but others might be, and how isolating and alone that they feel, and how to connect them with each other, and connect other family members with each other, because sometimes that's a problem. Yeah, you know, mom, mom and dad aren't getting along. They're not feeling connected. And then there's, uh, you know, all the spiritual stuff that's going on and people are not feeling connected to one another. And once they do, how powerful that is, especially if they need to do something with this entity or thing or whatever's going on with them, right? There'll be a united front. <clears throat> so it's important to be able to establish that. Yeah, and you bring up another point too, which... You know, even if there isn't so much of that in the beginning, a lot of times when they start having paranormal experiences, that in itself isolates them from mm -hmm. everyone else because they're being terrorized. Like if you think about like an abusive relationship, you know, like from what we know, a lot of times that individual, they they disconnect from everyone. Shame, guilt, you know, people are tired of hearing about it or they want to hide it. At the same time, like it also causes so much stress and anxiety that they're kind of off balance. So that happens too during the process of the haunting. Yeah, I think that um, when people feel connected to something, whether it's a negative thing um, or something that's positive, then the direction in which the relationship goes and some of the momentum. Uh, of negative things happening, if it's a negative, you know, connection to a negative person or a positive, if it's connection to a positive person has a lot of momentum. And then that momentum uh, can take them in, you know, either really negative in a really negative direction or a very positive one, one that can fight against whatever is negative and present there, you know, just by having that good connection between, you know, you know, a person in the family or several people with one family member. Um, but if there is a connection in the other, in the other direction, a negative one with some kind of negative spirit. Yeah. That can be pretty powerful and make it robust against uh, something positive happening. And so it's being able to break, break through some of that. Yeah. It makes sense. Well, is there, look, we need to keep talking. Um, but I know you're super busy, <laughs> you've got papers to write and all kinds of things to do. Uh, so I'd love to be able to have you on again. There's still a ton of questions I want to ask about some of your investigating and, you know, things that you do. Um, is there anything today, Ryan, that you want to, you know, let people know about um, that you think is important, um, you know, for others to hear, you know, about the work that you do uh, that you want to say before we cut out for the day? <clears throat> Well, if people who are in the counseling profession are listening, I think that it's, I, I think this is part of being a multiculturally competent counselor is, you know, being familiar with some of this stuff, mm -hmm. you know, over 70% of Americans believe in the paranormal over half of, you know, people in this country have had some type of experience. You don't need to go and take a ghost hunter course to be able to help these people. But I think, again, just being present and listening with them, being willing to, you know, help them process some of the stuff is extremely important. Uh, there, I think it'll also help make with the cause a shift because, you know, there are a lot of people who are, you know, because this is kind of fringe, a lot of people who are having these experiences will reach out to people who aren't necessarily giving them the best help. You know, there are some great paranormal groups out there and then there aren't. And then I, I think the counselor counseling profession could be that next step in, you know, where people can go to, you know, to go to counselors instead of 
psychics online or something like that, you know, until all that gets figured out. Cause like, yeah, yeah that's, hope that makes sense, but it's just kind of like, this could be a, a safe space for them to help them versus them trying to go online and figure it out themselves. And then too, you know, for people who are having experiences, you know, you're not alone. Seek out the help. Yeah. And folks that are helping. Yeah. Be open. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Well, good. So thank you, Ryan, for being with us here today. Uh, Ryan Buell, uh, I appreciate your time and your story. So thank you. Want to have you on again. Um, and thank you all to everyone listening here today. This has been Paranormal Family Therapy, and I'm your host, Dr. Darren Wallace. So thank you, and we'll see you next time.